welcome to the Career Coffee Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Urban, Certified Career Strategist and Executive Coach, removing career roadblocks so you can achieve more impact, influence, and income. Welcome to Career Coffee Chat Live. I'm your host, Aaron Urban, Certified Career Strategist and Executive Coach, helping driven, experienced professionals remove career roadblocks to achieve more impact, income, and influence. And today on Career Coffee Chat, we have Sherry joining us to talk about how to leverage recruiter relationships. So a little bit about Sherry. Sherry is an experienced recruiter for Riverway Jobs here in Houston, Texas. And she has an international presence because she's joining us all the way from Denmark. And I'm super excited to have Sherry on the show today to talk about how to leverage recruiter relationships. The number one question I get as a coach, oftentimes from professionals seeking jobs or considering a new opportunity is, how do I align with a recruiter? Should I hire a recruiter? So what we'll do today is we will debunk some of those common career myths around recruiters, what recruiters do and what they don't do, and most importantly, how a recruiter can help you, the job seeker or someone who is looking for a new opportunity, successfully land that opportunity. And most importantly, what are recruiters looking for from job seekers like yourself? And how can you give them the information they need to help you be successful? So help them help you be successful. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Sherry in. Now, again, Sherry is an amazing recruiter and just a wonderful person. I'm so excited and thrilled that she has taken some time with us today to share with us how to leverage recruiter relationships. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Erin. Good. How are you this morning? Yeah, glad to see you. Sherry, share with us a little bit about your background. I've just mentioned really quickly to those joining in that you're an experienced recruiter and you love helping people land the jobs that they love. Um, so tell us, tell me a little bit about you and what, why, what is your passion for recruiting? What drew you, drew you to recruiting? Yeah, definitely. Well, Aaron, thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be on the show. Um, I've known you for quite some years and a very, um, I admire you greatly. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I, so I've been in recruiting for about 15 years now. I've joined Riverway Business Services back 12 years ago. Um, kind of as a baby recruiter, I like to think of myself as. Um, I did a lot of industrial recruiting at that point um, and some clerical and then moved to Houston, met Margo, our president, and kind of fell from there. Um, we do... Uh, well, I think the thing that really drove me to Riverway and well, in tomorrow going to stay into recruiting, especially on the agency side, was that you really can make a difference in people's lives. Um, we focus in administrative recruiting um, as well as a few other sectors, accounting and finance and customer service. And uh, when I first started, customer service and administrative were my two favorite sectors to, to recruit with them because you uh, able to make a connection for someone and then you see them grow in their career. And that's, I think, is what really is a passion. If you make that connection, you can provide some tips along the way, but that person really, really does change their life based on that connection you made for them. And so that's why I get up every day and do what I do and talk to people and, and go through things. I really want someone to put food on the table for their child or um, just, you know, get the next step in their career that they're looking for. That's great, Sherry. Thank you for sharing that journey. Um, Because I know that about you, that you're such a warm and caring person. So that's one of the reasons I reached out to Sherry first. (laughs) (laughs) I want to have a recruiter on. I'm going to ask Sherry. Thank you. And Sherry, I don't know about you, but as I shared before we we opened the show, was that there, I get the biggest question is, you know, should, I'm a job seeker, should I hire a recruiter? So there's a few myths running around about recruiters. And, and I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, hiring a recruiter, that's probably not something a job seeker does and exactly. how do recruiters work. So we just understand that foundational level of what a recruiter does. It's great. And it's a great question. Before I got into recruiting myself, I remember I interviewed at an agency and um, they wanted to, me to go in another position. I'm like, wait, no, I want to work here. Like, I don't understand this process. So whenever I talk to someone too, and if they've never worked with a recruiter before, I try to set some guidelines because it's a little bit different. You don't hire a recruiter per se. You start a relationship with a, with a recruiter. Um, and recruiting in today's day and age is so different than it was 15 years ago when I started. Each recruiter really has specific industries or fields that they recruit within. So for example, 
um, I really focus in accounting and finance and administrative. So if someone came to me and said that they are a engineering tech, um, they want me to find them a job. Uh, I probably because it's not the industry nor the field that I really focus in. Um, and so if someone's looking for, uh, you know, working with a recruiter, they need to make sure that recruiter works in their field, in their industry. Um, otherwise, the connections that recruiter has is not going to benefit that candidate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sometimes where uh, candidates get frustrated, where you didn't find me a job, but I didn't, I don't work in that space. I don't have connections in that space. I can't find you a job in that space if I don't have if the companies you work, work with do not hire in that space. Um, right. so, it's, so it's really asking, making sure that they hire within that space. Um, the, the, you know, I'm sorry, the, the recruiter hires within that space. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't hire a recruiter really. As, as I mentioned, um, the clients, the companies pay the recruiter the money. So that's where the, um, the, uh, the financial transaction comes from. Um, but without candidates, you don't have anything. So candidates are just as important to a recruiter as their clients are. Because um, I always say, and this is kind of uh, cheesy maybe, but I think of myself as a career matchmaker. Um, not every company is the right fit for every candidate and vice versa. So it's really trying to find that match and finding that recruiter that's going to work well with you. Um, I like to talk a lot. I'm not a big texter. Some candidates don't want me to text them, but I'm going to pick up the phone and call you. And if that annoys you, probably not the right person to work with. And there's probably people in my firm that don't want to talk as much as I want to talk. So it's really, it's as funny, it's even small as that is how do you like to communicate with someone? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, there's different, different areas to really look at when you're trying to find a recruiter that is going to have your best interest at heart and be able to create those connections that you're looking for. Right. And there's different types of recruiters, too, because the type of recruiting that you do is more, I would have to say, personalized. Yeah, um, that is not necessarily the case, particularly with what I call the the big box recruiting. Yes. Um, yes. So how much money do you want to make or how much money do you make? Or better yet, tell me what's on your W2 true story. Yes. That has been said to several of my clients, particularly around tax time. Um, and, then, and then it's like, you know, just, no, we just want to know this. We want to get off the phone, you know, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. Because these individuals are probably from the big, big box recruiting yep. firms and their paid commission based on the ideal candidate being put okay. forward because they have a job rec that's open. Otherwise, they don't give you the time of day. What are your thoughts about that, Sherry? Yeah, we don't like them. I I consider <laughs> um, I consider them the WalMarts of the recruiting world um, because it really it's, it's it's creating a you know that person's just another metric, whereas it's it's another um, conversation. So we work with some bigger companies. Our, our ideal clients are mainly midsize, um, where we can actually talk to the hiring managers. Um, those that's those are the clients we like to work with. But we do work with some bigger companies where we work with maybe five or six or seven to 10 other agencies. And I can't tell you how many times I have a great candidate, I submit them to a position, and then their age, the, the company's HR calls me and says, oh, Sherry, they've already been submitted. I'm like, what? So I call the person, like, you've already been submitted. Like, what do you mean I've been submitted? Well, some person I talked to two weeks ago, got their name, number, da, 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 shot them over in the system, and never, they, that candidate didn't even know that they were being submitted somewhere. Um, so it's, that's where the mis I know. <laughs> and it makes me mad because I, because then I think, well, this person's not going to represent this candidate very well now. Um, or sometimes they submit them to the different position that's a complete mismatch because that recruiter didn't take time to understand what's the pains. What does that person really want in that position? Is that hiring me under the right person to work under? Because if you are, um, if you like to have lots of detail and that person's too much of a big picture, you're going to hate that, that hiring manager, that manager. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's just, I think, and those recruiters would give the recruiting agencies a bad name. They call it headhunters or, um, I don't know, just, I've heard some bad things <laughs> over the yeah. years. Yeah. But um, it's just, it's just, it, it, I think, and um, they just don't represent us the way that we, that we do truly work. If you find a good recruiter um, with a good firm, it, you're, you're, you should have an exceptional um, experience with them too. Right. And then, Another thing too, um, Aaron, is sometimes you might have a really good recruiter with a not so uh, with one of those big firms, but you tend to find those recruiters wake, work their way out of those big firms. Because mm -hmm. if you work with a boutique firm that I work with, you can talk the way you want to talk. You get to have personal relationships. Um, my the president's never told me, Sherry, you you can't say this, or 
uh, you need to do this, Sherry. No, we, me and, me and her have weekly conversations about the relationships and the connections. And that's what it's about. Not about the way I sound over the phone. <laughs> so which right. is very different. And you different. ask this question and you have to check, check the box, check the box. Check yeah. the box. We have some great questions popping up here. So thank you for sharing that with me, Sherry. Okay. And it's interesting you mentioned that because as a career coach, I know a lot about it and, and I really want everyone joining to hear it straight from the source um, because I can tell you all day long, okay, there's different types of recruiters, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yada, and, but it's best to hear it straight from a professional like Sherry. So you will know exactly, you know, why it is you have this unfortunate experience sometimes with recruiters because we get a lot of bad, you know, a lot of bad feedback, you know, all oh, that they never bothered to call me back. And that's the big thing. And we'll touch on that here in a moment, but I really yeah. would like to answer some of these questions. That's okay. That's good. Um, let's see. So one of the big questions that's popped up a couple times is here, how do we find someone in our vertical? So how do we, how can we align with someone within our vertical? So this was from someone on Facebook yeah. and the banker asked, you know, how can I find someone in my specific industry? You know, he's an oil and gas engineering, et cetera. So if you are indeed in a, in a specific industry, how do you even find people? Do you just Google? Yeah, no, back in the day I did actually, <laughs> but that was long ago. LinkedIn is your best friend. LinkedIn is everything. Every recruiter should really specify in their bio what they're looking, who, who do they connect with? Um, and so um, I think LinkedIn finding, um, I believe you can do regular filter searches with LinkedIn, um, but every recruiter should have on there in their space what they're recruiting for and what they do recruit for. Um, I think th number one, that's the best place to go. Um, if, I don't know if people or the Houston Business uh, Journal um, in Houston, Texas is amazing um, newspaper. And there they usually have the top, you know, co companies as well. So you look in there, but that's mm -hmm. not always the best place to find your recruiter. Um, I think though, I think LinkedIn, in my, in my opinion, is probably the best place to start searching and looking. And if you talk to someone too, ask them for referrals. For example, I don't do any IT recruiting at all. I have two recruiters, kind of colleagues I work with that I'll refer them to because I can't find, make those connections for anyone in IT. So most recruiters should know other people in other verticals that they don't recruit and to help refer some of those uh, candidates to. Right, exactly. And you can do a search on LinkedIn. Um, I do know that if you have Job Seeker Premium, I think you're limited in how many searches you can do uh, per month. So you need to have a, a you know a larger a larger payout <laughs> premium yeah. plan. Thanks, LinkedIn. We love you, but <laughs> <laughs> but you can do um, just you know look at recruiters because rec recruiters will reach out to you on LinkedIn and look and see what is their specialty because yeah. recruiters specialties. Now, one of the questions here from Linda, she's got quite a lengthy story and her story is common. Um, Linda here is sharing a lot about how, hey, I had this experience and the recruiter never called me back. And just that that rude, um, unfortunately, big box recruiting experience. You know, yeah. why is it that these recruiters don't call people back? And there's multiple reasons. One, they've got a lot. They've got a lot of in males, probably 180 a day plus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so they can't get back to everybody. But from your perspective, Sherry, can you give some insight as to, you know, obviously there's different types of recruiters. Yeah. But why is that, you know, I talk to you and then nothing happens. Like I don't hear anything and you yeah. get, get gaslighted or ghosted. Definitely. It's probably that recruiter doesn't have a, the plain and simple, I think, point probably is that recruiter doesn't have a connection to, to, to a company or a job to connect you with. Um, if, if when you leave the phone call, the first initial phone call with that recruiter, you need to ask though, when can I, when do I, when can I expect to hear from you? What's, um, can I, you know, can we connect weekly, bi-weekly? You need to get that expectations guidelines from that very first phone call to understand how that communicate, how that recruiter does communicate. Um, if you don't have those expectations, my suggestion is always reach out to that recruiter. You can email, you can call. Email is usually a bit easier than calling, to be honest. Um, and nowadays, and like I said, some recruiters text. Um, but I, honestly, I think that most recruiters don't reach out because they just don't have a job opening to connect that person to. Um, that's probably the answer. Um, there could be, 
Yeah, there could be other things, but I more than likely it's because they don't have a job readily available for that person. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't want to call and disappoint that candidate that we had a great conversation, but I still don't have anything that, that you're going to, I'm going to, I can fit you with. So then they just do that avoidance that you're not supposed to do. I think a lot of it, and you just kind of go down a rabbit hole, unfortunately. So, so candidates, call your recruiter, email them, you know, try to reach out to them. If they don't reach out back out to you, sever that relationship. Don't even think about them. Move on. Go yeah. somewhere else. Find some yeah. money with somebody else, yeah. A lot of times this happens um, when people reply for jobs and a recruiter is managing that job rec and they have the initial screening call and like Linda shared, you know, we both agreed it wasn't the position for me and she would say she said she'd get back to nothing. Like yeah. she just hadn't heard anything. Um, so it's, you know, just keep reaching out and, and then do what you can. And then after that, toodles. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and there's a lot of... Yeah, there's a lot of recruiters out there. There's 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 going to be a recruiter that's going to be able to work with you and find that connection for you too. Yeah. yeah. So, how do you develop and leverage a recruiter relationship? How do you foster that relationship? It's really re connecting, make, creating that relationship. So, finding something with that recruiter that's off, like that's not business. So, for example, I grew up in Chicago. Anyone I talk to from the Midwest, there's that instant connection, and um, they stick in my head because it's because it's usually a more dynamic conversation. So the more you can find out about that recruiter um, before their conversation, the more you can make those connections with them. But also, um, uh, I think having open conversations with them too, reaching out to them, um, not sounding negative. I, I mean, as a recruiter, sometimes you don't always have the best news to give people. You didn't get the position, the hiring manager didn't, you know, didn't see the, the sizzle that I saw in you. So sometimes it's some difficult conversations we have to have and being positive and um, open about those conversations usually creates a very long standing relationship with that recruiter as well, because then the, it's a partnership at that point. Um, and it, you, you can tell it's definitely a, a give and take. It's not just a push, push, push. And I think sometimes recruiters feel they're pushed a lot by the candidates where it, it needs, you need to give some, and then you need to take some back as well. And speaking of that, actually, I have a good story about give and take with a recruiter and how you can develop that relationship with a recruiter like Sherry, who cares about their candidates. Um, and one way to do that is if you are not the best candidate for that role, feel free to recommend them to someone who is a, maybe a better candidate. And that way you're making that recruiter's life easier for them. And by doing that, that recruiter remembers you. And in fact, one at one point in my career, I was definitely a go-to person for continuous improvement uh, type roles. Even if it wasn't necessarily for me, this recruiter knew that I was well networked <laughs> within the industry and that, that no problem in leveraging that relationship. And that's okay. what it's all about. It's about leveraging the relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, yeah, you know, that's, that's not for me, of course, but I know so-and-so might be interested. I'll, you know, share you, you know, share your information with him, vice versa. And that was much appreciated. And that fostered and developed a relationship to the point where oh, wow, I was looking. Yep. Yep. Exactly. It worked so well. Yeah, it works so well. The charm. It works like a charm. Because the next thing I would love to hear from you, Sherry, is what else can a job seeker do? So we know recruiters have a lot on their plate right now. Um, there's not a, a lot of open job requisitions right yeah. this second. And there's a lot of people looking. And we understand the emotional investment in this because as a recruiter who cares, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's a hard place to be in. So what can a job seeker do to help a recruiter help them? Reach out. Reach out to them. Not on a, I would say, well, for me, it'd be every other week. Um, but try to have, as mentioned to a different kind of conversation as well. Um, you know, a quick email. Hey, this is Sherry. Um, I saw this lead the other last week. Do you work with this company? So try to have different conversations rather than I'm available. I'm available. I know you're available because you're sending me you're available, but having more of that dialogue together. Um, and I think especially now during the pandemic, asking how they're doing, you know, I have a family, I have a life. Um, I, I may have people that are affected and rarely do, I think, do recruiters get asked, how are we doing <laughs> sometimes? So having a genuine conversation with them when you do get them, get the chance to connect with them as well, goes a, a, a huge way. But I think Stop waiting for them to call you and be proactive. Call them, email them, shoot them a LinkedIn message, 
um, connect with them on LinkedIn as well too, um, because that's where I think you even make even further um, connections if you can love yourself, you know, through LinkedIn. Um, Facebook probably not. Facebook is only if you know each other for a few years, then you can do the Facebook request. But LinkedIn is a professional business network where it's great for you to connect on that area as well too. Also. I know as a recruiter, I'm really interested in seeing any um, articles on recruiting or HR in general or um, any conferences. I know everything's virtual now, but there's a lot of content that's in this world and I don't know all the content. And so if someone can help give me some content uh, as well, too, that, that really does make that impact and help. That's that's actually some of the basics of networking. Yeah. <laughs> and building relationships, you know, making mm-hmm. sure that we share value with people. Yeah. Um, someone asked here, uh, what are her thoughts on cover letters? Um, uh, are these the recommended as a good position? And those from, from Donnie's. And Donnie's, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not a cover letter. It's not always read. <laughs> yeah, it's not. No, it's not, they're not right at all. To be honest with you, I just I had a conversation with someone recently, and they're like, "Well, did you see my cover letter?" I'm like, "Uh, no, <laughs> I don't." We just don't. There's so much. There's um. There's not enough time to recover letters. Mm-hmm. My suggestion to everyone is create a professional summary at the top of your resume, and just as well. So as a recruiter, um, I'm probably seeing at least a hundred resumes a day, at least. So I'm looking for specifics in that resume that matches with the client, the culture, the position, something I'm looking for specifics. And so um, the professional summary at the top adds so much value, it allows me to really pick apart what are you looking for, what do you want to do, and then it draws me into further into your resume. If I don't see what I need to see at the top portion of your of your resume, I'm probably not going to look further at it. I'm just not. I, I, can't, I don't have time to hunt, and I shouldn't have to hunt. Um, and I think it's so, and I think it's hard for candidates sometimes to really show that what they're looking for. And I tell people, have three or four resumes. Hey, you want if you're open to different career changes. I mean, uh, Aaron, you know way more than I do, but <laughs> um, have, but make sure it's specific and you have that professionalism at the top, um, a summary at the top, and look at the job description. So if the job description has the requirement section. It requires A, B, C, or D. Make sure A, B, C, or D is in your resume somewhere and mainly at the top of your resume. Because then again, as a recruiter, I don't have to hunt for it. And corporate recruiters, they don't hunt at all. They put algorithms in their system. If those keywords don't come up, you're not going to pop up in front of that corporate recruiter at all. Um, So really taking time to do that professional summary, adding those keywords in, and ensuring the requirement section is covered in your resume, you're going to get through to a lot more recruiters. So what are your thoughts about, um, from what I understand, some hiring managers do require cover letters or some HR, internal HR manager, like to see that there was a cover letter created, even if they have no intentions of reading it, because it's true, people don't read cover letters very often. But it is a check the box mentality. So what are your thoughts, particularly with different types like engineering, for example, um, these types of people really are data oriented. So yeah. know, know your know your or your vertical, know your industry, know mm-hmm. what's expected. Um, and but don't spend a lot of time on your cover letter. Don't exactly. uh, whatever you do um, while you, you need to have the check the box mentality. If there's space for one, yeah, add one. But don't tailor the, your <laughs> Your whole cover letter to the job. Tailor it to the job in the cover letter. That has to be in the resume. Like Sherry just said, the first half of that first page is absolutely critical and making it relevant to the job description is, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that's how I train and coach all my clients and how they develop resumes is that first half of that first page has yeah. to be absolutely aligned. Now, it's interesting you mentioned summaries, Sherry, because I've heard from some recruiters, now everybody's different, this is the other thing we have to keep in mind because as job seekers, you hear tons of different information yes. and yes. well over half of it's all wrong. <laughs> like one page resumes. No. no, it doesn't have to be. At all. No. Cut yourself yeah. short. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how are you ever going to make it through after the tracking system with a one page yeah. resume? You can't. Um, so that's a myth. So your thoughts about a summary because I've heard that that's passe. Nobody reads them. Well, your summary needs to be, so summary can't be, I am a forward thinking individual. I am great communication skills, that blah, blah, blah. Tell me why you're a forward thinking individual. Why are you have great communication skills? Give me some meat 
from your experience and put it up there, it's kind of, I call it your sizzle. Um, if you have a 30 second, you know, your 30 second elevator pitch, you just don't sizzle, you go cover yourself. You really try to go, go with the, uh, the impact. So that's that summary needs to be that impact um, yeah. with examples um, of, 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 you know, why they need to look at you further. Um, mm-hmm. It could be years of experience, but be careful on that too sometimes. Um, and there, but it could be, uh, uh, you know, why are you, why are you stellar in your profession? If you can't answer that though, you probably got to sit down <laughs> and go through this, you know, you go through your pros and cons. We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses. I know why I'm a good recruiter, but I also have, I also have weaknesses. I know what those are, but in my professional summary, it's going to be my strengths but it's going to be an impact kind of examples um, to kind of illustrate those strengths that I have hundred percent. Right. What can you bring to the, to the organization? Yeah. And you're spot yeah. on with the sales pitch because that's exactly what I tell my clients. Yeah. That summary is just your sales pitch, your yeah. opportunity to tell the hiring manager what value you're going to bring and what impact you're going to make for that organization. So yeah, absolutely. And tailor it to the job description, but you're, you're spot on. I mean that those, those empty, Adjectives like yeah. I'm a, I'm hard work ethics. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. More. <laughs> you are, more. Like, for me, I mean, just think of it as you yeah. know, you're selling yourself. So those are all great. Yeah. Points. Thank you for sharing. Sharing for that. And then we've also heard that <laughs> you know recruiters really don't read the whole resume. We don't. Okay, and, and and I can't say we. I don't. <laughs> um, no, I am. It, it, it's pretty much everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm such a bullet person too. Resumes that are in paragraphs for the job under the job, if they're in a paragraph, I don't. Sometimes it just hurts my eyes because I've looked. I'm looking at so many resumes on a daily basis. So short and sweet bullet points is is, is the best. But if I don't see what I need to see for in that top portion of that resume, um, then I just don't, I don't look any further. Um, right. But it also depends, though. So, you know, I, I recruit in specific industries and I recruit for specific fields. So sometimes this person may look stellar. I don't have a job for them. But I'm still going to call that person because down the road, hopefully in a you know, few months, I'm going to have something for them and hopefully make a connection. Um, but again, it's, it's from what I see from that resume. But I, no, they don't see you don't you don't read the whole resume. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So Sherry, how, you know, we've talked about, you know, first half of the first page and the resume being so important. We've talked about the summary being so important um, and, and making that a sales pitch, not a boring list of obituaries. You mentioned and touched on a very interesting point, which was years of experience can help you or hurt you. Um, yeah. You can't overprice yourself out of the job. So be careful with that and think relevance. You want to align yourself with that position. If they're asking for 15, you have 30. Probably telling them you have 30 years is not good. Exactly. So yeah, so we <laughs> we want to be relevant to yeah. the job to the job description. But you know, what else can the job seeker do um, to help a recruiter help them? And you know, outside of maybe the resume, what what else is there you know, other than reaching out frequently, um, maybe polishing one's interview skills to show mm-hmm. up like they do for you uh, to the hiring manager? What else can they do? Well, yeah, that's a really good point. So I think to, especially today in, in this pandemic we're all living through, these virtual settings are so important because as a recruiter, when I represent you to my to one of our clients, one of our companies, um, I'm it's basically me saying you need to talk to this person. And I have a relationship with that with that hiring manager. So um, if it doesn't go well, uh, it usually um, looks bad on, on me. So I want to make sure that you're going to show up ready. You're going to show up prepared. You're not going to be in pajamas. You're going to be um, bright-eyed, excited. You're going to have the job description in front of you. You're going to have your resume in front of you. Um, you're going to ask relevant questions that we discussed, that we talked about, and you're going to be engaging in that in that interview. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, there's a lot of good content out there now on virtual interviewing because it's so uh, relevant. And you know, virtual sometimes space is not the right space for everyone. Sometimes. Um, I talk with my hands. I have to keep those down during my interview, during my virtual uh, communications, or um, maybe I'm not as energetic over virtual. When you see me in person, you can feel that warm fuzzy, but maybe I'm a little bit more stern virtual. So think about practice for yourself. Take your iPhone and, and start talking to yourself. Take videos of yourself. Um, practice some of those those skills and see how how you relay um, 
communication back because that's what's being received on the other on the other side. Um, so show up with show up to those interviews in the talks with the recruiter. Bring your A game. It's just as important you bring your A game with that, to that recruiter as it is to that hiring manager because otherwise they're not going to proceed forward with you. Right, right. That same spark you show the recruiter, you definitely want to bring that to the hiring manager. And some people get nervous, and that's totally understandable. Yeah. You know, doing a little bit of stress management, making you know maybe taking a walk doing a yeah. little bit of breathing exercise, clearing your mind or pretending like you don't care. And it's not that okay. we want to just, you know, act lackadaisical and in the interview, but sometimes, you know, not caring actually helps you be you. Because 100%. Is um, when we're in, when we're super stressed out, we're in fight or flight, that directs all our energy to a physical response, not mental. So our yeah. cognitive function actually slows down to heighten our physical function. And then inevitably after the interview, you go, oh, man, I, I wish I'd said whatever, because we just can't think clearly. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, someone had so a couple of questions here. We have a uh, question here from Facebook. Uh, how far back in ancient history <laughs> does one work? Do, do you go um, now? I don't know about you, Sherry, but I tell people around about the year 2000 is probably as far yeah. as you want to go. Do you agree I with that? 20 years. Or, yeah, I would say 20 quarter? years back. Yeah, 20 yeah. years back. No, no further. Unless they're going for a really senior leadership position, though, and that yeah. and that experience can then enhance that. Or sometimes, too, if you've been out of the career field for a while because you've been, um, I don't know, stay-at-home mom, you did something else, and you have relevant experience, then you could add that back in there um, and kind of create a not a chronological resume, but a skill functional resume where you m push your skills together. So, But 20 years usually is good enough for the resume. Right. And anything past that, you can always handle that in an additional experience section, remove the dates and just focus on the impacts and, and leave that for the interview. Because after all, a, re a resume is just to incite a conversation, yeah. not close the conversation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a two way street. You've got to make sure you like that hiring manager as well, because that's who you're going to be working underneath. And most people leave managers, not companies. So if you don't like that manager you're interviewing with, go with your gut. It's probably not the right match for you. That's right. That's right. In fact, I have a client um, who is having a very interesting conundrum because she has great relationships where she is. She's an oil and gas. Um, however, as we all know, oil and gas is not doing so well right now. Um, and she's been looking for opportunities elsewhere, accepted a position to only find out that her potential hiring manager is not a um, pleasant person. To work with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I said, you know what? If you have great relationships where you are now. Stay. Okay. Stay. 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 <laughs> and I make that jump. Looking. <laughs> Keep looking. So Patricia has a good question here. She says, how can you be relevant when job posts such as VP of marketing ask for only five to seven years, even though the rest of the description asks for so much more interesting point, Patricia, people right now are trying to get all the bang for the buck. Wouldn't you agree, Sherry? We're seeing some interesting things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, because for a lot. we call this a client-driven market. So even I would say fall of last year, we called it a candidate-driven market where um, there's not enough candidates looking for jobs, where now it's flip-flop. So we call it a client-driven market, which is the least favorite market for, I think, anyone to work in because they want 20 years of experience, but they want to pay five-year salary for it. Um, yeah, it's, you know, um, it's hard. I've been a recruiter for so long. I have those relationships where I can then under kind of see points. Whereas if you're a candidate, you don't know really what they're looking for on that end. Um, I don't lie on your resume ever. Never lie on your resume because you're, it's not going to be the right fit. You can withhold things, a couple things maybe here and there. Um, but I, I would, I would show my full, I, in all honesty, um, if I'm a professional, if at a mid-level professional, I would show all my experience and my 20 years of experience if I'm applying for five to seven years, because then um, I may not be the right fit for that job, but there may be another opening down the road for for there for uh, uh, with the with that company. Um, right. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting when you do interview more, the better you get at it, and you yeah. may build a relationship because even though you might not be the best fit for that specific role, exactly. they may call you back for a different and maybe better role. So, yeah. Um, yeah, don't don't hesitate to apply. And the other thing, Sherry, that we're seeing, um, unfortunately, is that some some employers are taking advantage of 
job seekers and like Desmond reached out to me just the day before yesterday in response to one of my um, one of my emails I send out to my my career growth community a couple times a month. I don't inund- inundate people, but you know, yeah. send some some information and let people know to be on this show. But he shared with me. He said, you know, we're back to two thousand nine salary. He goes, this is crazy. He's, I took a yeah. huge, huge cut, and it it's sad because. Yeah, it's it's just sad. I mean, we would like it to be otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So it's unfortunate because you've worked so long to build your career to a certain level, and now you're asked to make half of what you were making. Um, you know, I think I think sometimes. So during the interview process, when you're going to interview process, when it's the right time to discuss compensation, um, maybe ask what is the what is the trajectory of this role look like? So, mm-hmm. so to really cover compensation, um, you know, when, how many? Uh, when does the compensation review come in? Um, do you have annual compensation reviews? Is there a bonus potential? Um, what's the growth potential for this position? Because normally, if you if you start a position at forty thousand, you're going to save forty thousand for a while. I say never expect more than a three thousand or three percent pay increase um, per year. Um, unless there's growth potential. So if you start at, I don't know, marketing associate one, but you can become a marketing graphic, something, I don't know, like there, there's that growth, then mm-hmm. you can make more money. Um, but I think you need to ask those questions when the, when the compensation review, um, what does it look like? Is there bonus potential? You need to know all of that uh, because some companies are just hurting right now. They want to offer more. They can't, um, but then they should be, they, they're the ones that will have that growth lined out for you. The ones that just are not offering more, those ones, unfortunately, are probably taking advantage. And then right. you're going to jump ship in two to three years. And they know that because they've probably been to this already. <laughs> and if they're not even having a conversation now with yeah. you, just know that they have no intentions of giving exactly. you money. Um, exactly. And if they are having that conversation now, yeah, you know, this is where we're at right now um, for potential for growth or maybe a sales salary increase once the economic, economic situation yeah. uh, looks a little bit better then you might want to have that language written down somewhere. Thank you. A hundred percent, Erin. That's bingo. Yeah, <laughs> bingo. Because I have been there um, as a young professional. I got promised some things and never had it written down. And Yeah. And then you're just screwed. Um, excuse my language. Yeah. Then you're just, you're out of, <laughs> no, sorry I said that. <laughs> yeah. Fine. We're your coffee chat. We're, uh, it's still PG thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So uh, let's see. Al says, "Do they really hold your resume?" And I'm assuming he means recruiters for other potential future openings. Mm-hmm. Yes, I would agree. Hundred percent, Al. Yeah, no. So our database is basically the connections that I've spoken to over the years. So if we have a connection, you send me your resume. You are going into my database. And um, I, you're in there and it may be six months and maybe three months and maybe two weeks, maybe the next day that I want to call you. But yeah, as soon as you send your resume to the recruiter and have that connection call, you go into that database. And mm-hmm. most, most, most agencies nowadays use cloud-based um, databases that are easy to filter and find people. And um, it's, it's like, remember the old school Rolodex business cards? You used to have, you know, well, my dad used to have them. <laughs> um, I see them on his desk. Uh, but that's basically the database is now. So um, I know agency recruiters hold resumes because that's how we make our connections. Um, I don't know about corporate talent acquisition professionals. So I don't know if, how long your resume stays in those databases. I don't know what, yeah. what that. Yeah, I think we have a time frame. And it's the applicant tracking system. You can actually go in and manage your application status, also update your resume, et cetera, et cetera. So they have um, ATS systems. But yeah. you have to you have to keep refreshing it within their system because it does you know dump after a certain amount of time that could be six months could be a year could be three years so yeah I'm not sure about that but yeah every recruiter has a database um, so just note Al that there's a big difference between you know how Sherry works as as a more boutique personal relationship driven recruiter and then the big box recruiters. yeah um, there's a big difference um, for one the big box recruiters have tons of more people to pull from and also yeah. they're not as relationship driven as I've, I've noticed um, yeah. as, as more personal touch recruiters. Now there is another myth out there, Sherry, I would like to clear up the myth 
that you can indeed hire this person called a headhunter or a recruiter, which are not, they call themselves a headhunter, yeah. uh, to find a job for you. You pay them money yeah. to find a job. Now, I know the answer to this, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about <laughs> yeah. individuals. You don't pay anyone to find a job for you unless you are a C-level executive. Even then, you probably shouldn't. You should be have, using your own network to find your own job. But um, no, we, we're, we're considered, a, most agencies are considered a contingent-based agency. What that means is that um, our clients, the companies, pay us money. So if I, so you as a candidate, I will never, there'll never be a transaction between, um, we'll t- we're taking money from you whatsoever. Taxes, if you're on our payroll, yeah, you know, we have to take taxes, um, that kind of thing. But you should never pay anyone to find you a job because there, it's just not the way the relationship works. It works, the financial transactions happen between our company, the agent, the recruiting company, and the, the company you're, you're contracting at. Never through the never never from you. You don't you don't pay for that. You shouldn't have to pay for that, in my opinion. Right. And what I tell people is, if if someone reaches out to you and says, "Oh, just pay me whatever, and I'll find you a job. I'll I'll you know spruce up your resume, or I'll you know give you access yeah. to all these secret jobs that no one else yeah. has access to. Run, do not walk to the nearest exit because this person is a scammer. And I do know many people in Houston, the Houston metro area, that. Yeah and they scam job seekers yeah. for a lot of money and and because this is a public platform i cannot say their name but if you'd like to know who it is i'm happy <laughs> that information i uh, i am me or inmail me or email me i'm happy to yeah share information and so, so aaron on the on the note too so if you're so some people are you know because as you mentioned we're living in this big internet world and stuff if you're uncomfortable thinking well is this person uh, if you feel that you don't know how the interaction works ask that recruiter who how do you get how who gets who pays the bill just ask them who pays the bill and they can tell you the, the company pays the bill you don't pay anything if they don't tell you that the like Aaron said walk away 100% because you don't want to be stuck in any weird situation at all yeah yeah you don't you don't want anything not not legitimate exactly. so uh, someone from Facebook asked are there any other do's and don'ts that we need to keep in mind as a person who's seeking new opportunities how to leverage a recruiter um relationship what does that yeah look like? is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to share with those that are joining in definitely well, well i'm gonna i have an interviewing tip is this is gonna i'm gonna lose if i don't say it now um so and i'll go back to the do's and don'ts and, and working with recruiters so but my the biggest interviewing tip that i learned is that before you go to your interview make sure you write down your uh, strengths are the biggest attributes you um, acquire from that company or what value do you bring to certain companies. Write everything down on a piece of paper the night before because normally if it's been 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that has gone to your long-term memory. Um, and so if you write it down, you're pushing it up to your short-term memory and under stress, we tend to not, we can't tap into that long-term memory. Mm-hmm. But if you push it to your short-term memory, when you're interviewing, we're all a bit anxious. Um, most of us are, um, you'll be able to get that, be, get, get that context back faster than you would if you didn't take the night before and push it to your short-term memory. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but so tips with working with recruiters too, be proactive. Um, I kind of mentioned that already. Reach out to them, but not too, too much. Um, don't sound too pushy because they, they aren't required to find you a job. Um, we're required to make a match for our clients for the for the companies um but we want to make a match for you too um so if if i don't have a position for you i just don't have a match at that point um and i can't stress that enough because you don't want to just get a job you're going to be looking in a year six months you'll be miserable and um i never want to place someone in a position they're going to be miserable in so it's important to as a as as a recruiter as a candidate looking ask the recruiter um how long have you worked for that company do you know the hiring manager have you spoken to the hiring manager start asking some of those questions as well because we don't we don't get the opportunity to speak with all of our hiring managers but the ones that i do speak with and that i do have our relationships with um i can probably find that stricter match faster and know that you're going to be a better fit and just take my just if I say it's not going to work it's just not going to work and take my advice and just be okay with it <laughs> because sometimes it's it's, a, it's one of those soft skill things that's just or personality mismatch and that's hard to that's hard to you know hard to kind of um it's a hill you don't want to climb in a new position 
um, to take the tip. Oh. One of the reasons why most people quit jobs, actually, as a career yeah. coach, I can tell you with a fact that uh, work style mismatches are a, a big deal and it can be a very toxic environment. Definitely. So, you know, someone like Sherry, who has a lot of experience doing this and, and knows how to spot these warning signs, you know, don't don't get mad. Exactly. Don't be <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> we're, she's trying to help you avoid yeah. a very potentially toxic environment. So. Yeah. Yeah. And also your resume, too. I know that you're probably so tired of changing your resume, doing this to your resume, because I know that we all ask different things for your resume. But I'm asking that because I know this hiring manager and I know if this thing is not the top of your resume and each of your positions that you have, they're not going to look at you. I know it. Um, so take the advice of the recruiter. If you have a good relationship with them and, and make those adjustments on your resume and work with them, we may need to send the resume back four or five times. Um, but but trust that recruiter that's giving you that advice because they're doing it for your benefit um, to help me make that better, that best match for you. Right, right. And those those suggestions to tweak on your resume are totally personal for that particular hiring scenario. Oh, yes. It's not really meant to say, OK, from here on out to the to infinity and beyond, you should yeah. <laughs> make these changes. It's just just know that in order to put this forward and put your best foot forward and be seen and be heard. This is the best way to proceed 100%. with your documents or, you know, sometimes recruiters will even share something personal about, you know, nothing too deeply personal, but something yeah. will help you um, connect better with, uh, with the person you're interviewing. Yeah. With. So, yeah. Yeah. So we'll probably wrap up here in just a few moments. But uh, Sherry, are you open to uh, connecting with anybody that has tuned in? Yes, please do. I'd love to connect and answer any further questions, um, talk about your experience and see if I can maybe hopefully make some connections for you. I would really appreciate that. Yes, Erin. Yeah, wonderful. So reach out to Sherry. Her information will be in the event description, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can reach her at uh, Riverway. Uh, Riverwayjobs, I believe, dot com. It's it's also in the event description. Yeah. I got that wrong. I'm so thrilled to have you on, Sherry. It's been a deep pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, so thankful you could give up your time. I know it's a little late there on the other side of the pond. And, <laughs> and a little hot, guys. You know, those of you who are from Houston, Texas, it's 90 what in Denmark right now? Yeah, 91 here and no air conditioning. So um, we're just working through it. <laughs> You know, unfortunately, that part of the world is not used to these temperatures. No, so that's, no. That's, that's pretty awful. So thank you so much for taking the time, Jerry. It's been wonderful. Wonderful hearing from you from the perspective of someone who not only is a wonderful recruiter, but also truly cares about your clients and making that match happen. And I like thank it. It's you, not easy at all um, if you feel like a matchmaker, career matchmaker. And that's yeah. true. <laughs> So if you loved this show and you would like to share this with your network, make sure you can help those that are potentially yeah. looking for opportunities. Please do share this, uh, this show. Um, would love to have you do that and make sure we spread the word and help everybody out there because there's a lot of people who need to have career yeah. growth opportunities as well. And again, this is Career Coffee Chat. My name is Aaron Urban. This is Sherry. And we're very happy to see you today. Very happy to have you tune in. And we'll be tuning off for now. We'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in on the Career Coffee Chat podcast. It's been a pleasure. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is coacheurban at gmail.com or tweet at coacheurban, Instagram coach.eurban, or reach out to my Facebook group, Elevate Your Career. So I'd love to learn more about you, hear your insights, and what questions you have. You can find out more about me at CoachyUrban.com. And don't forget, please do reach out on LinkedIn. You can find me at Aaron Urban. Until next time, cheers. Here's to caffeinating your career.